So, um, as you can see, I've got mm. a few pieces yeah. from Dominic Benura, uh, who's, I think right now, of the young ones, the leading sculptor in the country. Um, that piece is called Feeling Good. Mm. So you can see the ladies yes. holding a dress. Yeah. Spreading a dress like, yeah. 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 And, and it's made out of um, a serpentine rock. Um, it's very special to me because... Um, uh, Trevor, when you come here, or, or I myself, are feeling a little down, a little blue. We walk down to mm, her, mm. and we converse with the feeling good lady. Mm. And you and I, after the conversation with her, mm. we start feeling good. Absolutely. And I noticed that she's got short hair, hey? uh, short African hair, natural hair. <laughs> Trevor, <laughs> this home, this place, <laughs> is for the natural. Woman. Beautiful. Natural in every sense of the word. Beautiful. Natural skin, natural hair, natural lips, everything natural. Wonderful. Because we love the black lady. The way the black natural. lady looks was created then to be. Then Gurira made this sculpture famous because 2018 Christmas, she came here for lunch and uh, she liked the garden, she liked the sculptures, but she fell in love with feeling good lady. Mm. So she had a picture taken. In fact, if you Google, just Google Dana Gurira Guramatunu, mm. that lady that comes, comes out. out. Yeah. And, and, and Dana is holding a dress, uh, imitating the, the, the so good lady. lady yeah. and, and she sent out on the Instagram, Christmas greetings from Zimbabwe. Mm. Feeling, feeling good. good. The Dominic Benura Guramatunu collection. collection. Zimbabwean art. And this thing went viral and there were so many comments from all over the world about that lady. So she's a famous lady. She's a famous lady. She's a beautiful lady. You you feel the connection when you're looking at her. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Solomon, for walking me around the garden, showing me this beautiful piece um, and for welcoming us uh, into, your, into your home and seeing your art collection, seeing your sculpture. We, we're so grateful. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure, Trev, to have you here. And, uh, you know, these buildings are just buildings, brick and mortar. But what's important is what happens inside of buildings. This place is for everyone to enjoy. I mean, I can't enjoy the art on my own. But I have friends like you coming to appreciate the art mm. and appreciating our artists and their work. Then it makes me very happy. Mm. This lady is um, Virginia Chuhota. Yeah. One of the most uh, talented of, of our artists in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's one of those um, artists that um, the National Gallery of Zimbabwe has sent to the Venice Biennale. Wow. And all of a sudden, these artists like her have become uh, very popular worldwide. They have their work uh, displayed in uh, London, in New York, in Cape Town, everywhere. And this piece is called um, mistakes in straight lines. Wow. Now, a lot of people who look at this have their own ideas about what it means. Mm -hmm. But this is mistakes in straight, straight lines. lines. And I think the more you look at it, the more you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more you try and understand it. Mm -hmm. But it's really outstanding. Um, I bought this at an auction in the National Gallery of Zimbabwe. It was a big... Um, um, you know, a dinner dance, and um, so it was a must ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved it so much, I had to bid the highest to get it. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. And and is that the same person? No, no, uh, no. This is um, Portia. Okay. Okay. Yeah, she's also very outstanding. Okay. And the two of them really, I think of the lady artists we have, they're mm -hmm. the most outstanding. Mm. And and of course their work is increased so much in mm. value mm. all over the world. So I was very lucky to get it. And I can mm. tell you, it's all gone up five, six times now. Wow. We enjoyed ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back to In Conversation with Trevor, where we are talking to Dr. Solomon Guramatunu at his uh, beautiful home. And again, thank you, Doctor, for your hospitality. You are a man with a big heart. You give back so much. You are a man who, is, uh, who loves life and lives life to the fullest. We're going to focus on that right now. You um, love dancing. Yes. And um, uh, Bob Marley said, forget your troubles and dance. And somebody once said, dance is a hidden language 
of the soul, what does dancing do to you? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear music, I don't need to be invited to dance. I just dance. Uh, and what happened to me was I'd gone to Cuba mm -hmm. on holiday. I told myself when I was in high school that I wanted to go to Cuba one day because of um, the revolution giving health to everybody, you know, um, intellectually developing their people to be professionals and so on. So I went to Cuba when I could, and then I was in Havana and, and Varadero. So I went to a club and I saw the Cubans dance. I think what they call, the French call the joie de vivre. The Cubans have that, they dance from here. And I saw those moves and I said to myself, Solomon, you have to acquire these skills. So when I came back, I looked for a dancing teacher, and I got learned, taught um, you know, salsa, bachata, merengue, all these um, um, Latino dances. Mm -hmm. And the more I danced, the more I loved it, and the more I loved the music. To the extent that then I went to Buenos Aires in Argentina to learn the history and also how to dance tango. That's when I discovered that, in fact, tango came from uh, the Afro-Argentinians. People don't know this. And when I used to speak about this at dinner, people, dinner tables, I'd say, is this guy okay? Is, is he, is Out he of crazy? his mind. Yeah. Don't know that 30% of the population of Buenos Aires at that time, there's the last, turn of the last part one century, was actually black. And as you know, the blacks are always in the inner city. And Buenos Aires is a huge port. So sailors would have been on the sea for months or for weeks. The first place they wanted to visit was the Bordello, the mm -hmm. brothel. So mm -hmm. they'd wait like you near know, doctor surgery. And the owners of these brothels, they went to the inner city where the blacks were right. to bring guys to come and entertain these waiting sailors who were very restless and fidgety. So they could sing to these sailors. And um, eventually, they brought in the ladies too. You know, these were tough ladies also, you know, from, the, from the inner city. And slowly, slowly, they improvised a movement. So it, da, da, then, mm -hmm. like it's almost rough, you know? Mm -hmm. And the girl is tough. She's got a red stiletto shoe. She'll run up this shoe up the men's leg, get mm -hmm. between his legs and kick him mm -hmm. to tantalize him. Mm -hmm. That's how tango started. A lot of people don't know this story. Wow. And then, of course, I went to Mexico also for salsa, and I've been to Brazil a couple of times to learn samba. So normally I go to eye conferences and I combine that with my dancing passion. Wow. Tango, salsa, samba? It, yeah. And of course, the highlight of my dancing uh, hobby was uh, the day that Prince Harry and Meghan got married. Now, the previous British ambassador here, Katrina Lang, was my dancing partner for three years, and she loved dancing as much as I did. So every Sunday, we danced, either at the British residence or right here. And uh, we attended what, what they call an ambassador's ball. Mm -hmm. That was exactly the same night. And we did a salsa. We were wearing black with uh, Zimbabwe flag colors. And for the bachata, I wore the Union Jack, the British. And that was a beautiful evening. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then, you threw uh, a farewell party for Katrina Lang yeah. in this house. She loved this place. Mm. And she said to me, please, can I have my farewell party at your mm. house? I said, of course mm. not. No problem. So we, we were in the tennis court mm. and everybody came, you know, the American ambassador, the German ambassador, the South Korean ambassador, every Indian ambassador, everybody came here. And, and, and we had quite a party. Wow. And, and then, you, you love Zumba too. Oh, yeah. Every, yeah. Talk, every, talk to me about that. Every Saturday when I'm in Harare, I go to Zumba, mm -hmm. and after that I have a class of yoga. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love Zumba because it's the music mm -hmm. and the dance. Mm -hmm. You know, Trevor, what people don't realize is, I, I, I saw a program on, on Emirates, on lifestyle, and they said, of all the activities that we do, whether it's walking, hiking, uh, swimming, and so on, dancing is the most benefit. And they found out that, in fact, it can prevent or even reverse senile dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. And that's why you find in old people's homes in Europe, in states now, people are taught, the old people are taught dancing. Mm. So in their 70s, 80s, 90s, they're, it they're does something the to, yes, to yes. you. Yes. So I recommend everybody, you must dance. I, I've got two left legs. Can you teach me how to dance? Oh, yes, easily. Trevor, anybody who can walk mm -hmm. can dance. There's a Japanese girl, oh, by the way, 
this place, was, everyone knows my place is for dancing. I've had South Korean women here, Japanese ladies, Chinese ladies, Indian ladies, white ladies, black ladies come here to dance. Because Do you teach dancing? I teach, but okay. I'm also a student. I have okay. a, a teacher who comes here. So if you can't dance, I can teach you the basics, but my teacher mm. takes you to another level. Mm. And, and so this home is basically for dancing. In addition to that, your, your travel has taken you to places and you, have, you now speak quite a number of languages. Um, speak to me about that. Well, I, you know when you travel a lot and you want to mix and mingle, you also want to learn the language. Yeah. Um, so I enrolled myself at the Alliance Francaise to learn French. As the, then they became, made me president for two years, which was lovely because they sent me to, to Paris, to Monte Carlo and all these places. And then I realized that once you learn French, they call these Romance languages, it becomes easy to speak Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. And the funny thing is, my French, I didn't practice a lot because I became like an administrator. And then I had a, an Angolan lady come here who never spoke a word of English. I had become friends with um, Irene Neto, you know, Augustino Neto's daughter, who's an eye specialist. So we're supposed to work together, so we used to go to Angola. And she sent a nurse here for me to train. And the funny thing is, I learned to speak Portuguese in such a short time because I had to speak to Portuguese in her. And in four weeks, I was fluent in Portuguese. Oh, wow. So yeah, I love languages too. You've got a rich life, uh, Solomon. Interesting life. But you go and do something absolutely crazy. Scuba diving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What happened, Trevor, is uh, yeah. I went to visit a friend of mine in the Seychelles Islands. And he trained at the same, same time as I did in Scotland. So we've been very good friends. He now lives in Tasmania. And I went there and I saw these people with wearing black so wetsuits and they had tanks on their back. So I became curious. So I went to find out. I said, oh, this is scuba diving. So I went to find out. Uh, in the office, what it was, it was all about. So they told me about it and I got interested. So they said, okay, you can do a short course, just like three hours, and we take you to the pool, we teach you how to breathe, and more importantly, how to maintain balance, the buoyancy. So I did that, and then they said, okay, we go to the sea. So the first dive was shallow, like eight, 10 meters, and I did that. Uh, but the key thing, you have to balance the pressure outside and inside. Because if you don't do that, then you have so much pain, you can go down. Mm. Then I went back the year after, and I did the full course. And I really got interested in scuba diving. And then uh, the year after, I went to the Maldives to do the advanced course, where you actually dive at night. In the middle of the night, you can go down the bottom of the sea. Mm. And where there are fast water, they train you how to, to get down as well. And after that, I really got the bug. So I ended up going to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, Sri Lanka, all these places, Shamil Sheikh in Egypt, Elat in Israel, and then um, Sodwana. Mozambique was one of the best dives I ever did in my life. And then when I went to Cuba, uh, Jamaica also, I, I was diving, and Mexico, and then Hawaii. But the highlight is Bahamas. I've done that twice now. I do that for my birthday. You dive with sharks. So you originally catch you anything but they train you just to behave yourself. But the sharks come around, you can even you can feel the belly on your head. Because some guy comes in with fish, uh, smoked fish. So when the sharks smell the fish, they get into a feeding frenzy and they come boom, very fast. And he picks and he just holds and they come boom. And you are in there. Yeah, you just, you, you sit around like we're sitting right now, mm. but you sit mm. quietly and like this. Mm. And I've got some photographs of that and some videos. T tell me, what does that, what, 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 what's the experience like? What do you, what's the excitement about scuba diving? Talk to me about that. When you scuba dive, it's like being taken to another planet. It's just different. The corals, the, the, uh -huh. the, the sea life. I mean, you see if, if, if fish with one color, maybe with a purple dot. Uh -huh. It's just amazing to describe what you actually see down there. I mean, and when you see... I think all these um, documentaries we see don't do justice to the actual experience itself. And I remember Mozambique, we were in Villanculos, and, and it was early in the morning, like, I think 5.30 or 6 o'clock, and we were on a boat going to the reef uh, near Bazaruta and all that, and we had dolphins 
almost three on one side, on each side, and they're you know, jumping up and down. And so it's, it's the excitement of uh, the, the, the animal life that you experience? Uh, what else? And, and, and the corals. Okay. It, it's just a different environment. And, and it doesn't matter what you believe, you realize this world is such a beautiful place. And the beauty, even of the fish and the corals, is amazing. And you get these plants, which are like plants, but in fact, if you put your finger, they'll get hold of you. Um, it's amazing. And, and, and I've seen the sharks too. Oh, the shark is just like an aeroplane. I, I tell you, you, you know, the way you, you, you talk about it, you, you want to make me want to do it. You uh, must do but it. But I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Nah. But, uh, <laughs> let's move over to, now to another hobby of yours, uh, collecting uh, art, uh, paintings, uh, uh, sculpture. You've got amazing sculpture around your, 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 your garden. What got you into that and what's the, the, the most exciting sculptures that you've been, been able to collect? Um, I started in the early 90s. I was going to these um, art fairs and I saw this and, and I started thinking to myself, it would be wonderful for me to possess some of these art paintings because they kind of speak to you. Um, you know, the sculptures, every sculpture that I have is a story. How many do you have in the garden? Do you remember? I don't know. I don't know. All, all I know is, well, I know for, for instance, Dominic Benora, I have four of his very big ones. Mm -hmm. And I've got the dance at the, at the, at the, near the entrance. Mm -hmm. I've got the feeling good lady. Uh, I've got the mother and child, the iconic one. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, he's, he did one of me as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these are four. But I have also have um, uh, Bernard Matemera mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Henry Munyarad mm -hmm. and, and the other one. So, so is it an investment or what is, what is it to you? Good question. Mm -hmm. When I started, I didn't think about the investment. But later on, I realized that, in fact, people invest in that. And the youngsters, you know, like Mkumbiranwa's sons, the boys come here. So we were fixing some of my sculptures, and they said to me, you know, doctor, one day, your art collection will be worth more than your house. Mm -hmm. That's what they told me. I thought, wow, these guys know about this. And then the... These, they call themselves Zim Sculpt. It's, it's a couple, uh, Joseph is French and Vivian. We were at Amanzi and I was with uh, Katrina and I said to, to Joseph, Joseph, you suppose they go overseas and spend time in the States, in Canada, in Europe, selling Zimbabwean sculptures. I said, you know, the sculptures I have, so what, how much would they be worth? Mm. And he said to me, oh, oh, those big ones from Dominic? Oh, well over six, six figures, he said. I said, so I said wow. So I said to Katrina, I see Katrina, I'm not just a pretty face. <laughs> but that's that's that. not how you start, why you no, started. No, 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 no. I'm just amused yeah, that yeah. it can be an investment. And, you know, I mean, one day I'll be gone. Yeah. So, and then the art pieces, you have lots of beautiful art pieces, your paintings and, and, and stuff, yeah. You know, the ones in here, mm -hmm. these are very special. Um, that one, which we can talk about, mm. is, is um, Virginia uh, Chihota. There's Portia. Uh, the other two. The gallery sends four artists to the Venice Biennale eh, every two years. And what's happened is our artists from Zimbabwe who have been to Venice, mm. all of a sudden the world takes an interest. And they become so popular and so big and, and, and the value of their work is just like quadrupled and, and it's gone up and so on. And they, they now work is exhibited in London, in Cape Town, in New York and all over the place. So I fell in love with this and I, and I bought. Again, I didn't think it was, I just loved them. But I've now realized these things are now worth quite a lot. So, so do you t tend to collect mostly Zimbabwean art and, and sculptures? Is that what you're doing? Primarily. Okay. But I also have some work from... Uh, from Indonesia, mm. and I had some work also from Vietnam. Mm. This is a place that I travel and sometimes I buy. Tell me, do you think do you think that Zimbabweans appreciate the value of uh, this cultural heritage that we have? Point number one. Point number two. Do we give enough recognition to the artists who produce this work? Trevor, that's a lovely question. Petina Gaba the other day said to me, "You know, art is the soul." of a society. It is the soul of a nation. And there's a lot of wealth 
Some people are very wealthy in this country. And I always say that um, if people from elsewhere come here, they appreciate and invest in our art more than we do, we run the risk of maybe being very educated or very wealthy, but not enlightened. What, what should we be doing, Solomon? Well, I think we really ought to support the artists. We have amazing artists in this country, mm. as evidenced by what's happening when they go to Venice mm. and other places. It's so sad that the rest of the world appreciates our own art, and we don't. And I'm sure you've read that, about that collection in, in, in Atlanta, in yeah. the airport. Yeah. And, and I remember meeting the, the actor, Danny Glover in LA, and he had such a huge collection, and he was talking, Oh, excitedly about, about our art collection. And then there was another eye specialist, very prominent in the States. I was embarrassed. This guy used to come here and he knew our artists by name. He knew their families, their sons, their daughters. What's wrong with us? Because, I mean, I, I, one, one thing that I noticed, uh, I noticed Solomon, is when you're flying out of Vic Falls to Johannesburg, when you're flying out of uh, Harare to Johannesburg, the number of... Uh, sorry to say this, but white tourists carrying our, our stones of sculpture. And yet we live in this place, we see this stuff, but we don't seem to appreciate it. Trevor, one word, mindset. Mindset, mindset, mindset. Which takes me to something that you're passionate about, which is very controversial. Yes. So I'm, not, I'm now gonna get you to trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. So you, you, you are, You've been going on now for some time. Yes, about about five years. Uh, now. Five years now that uh, uh, black women should appreciate their hair and wear their hair and not buy wigs. Why? Um, thank you for this opportunity to explain myself. How this started, Trevor was I was walking in town and I saw our ladies slapping their scalps and scratching and so on. And I observed that other races don't do that. The whites don't do that, the Chinese don't do that, the Indians don't do that. So I asked the girls in my office, what is it, what is happening? And they said, oh doctor, it's the weaves, they're itchy. So okay, educate me, what are these weaves? They said, well, there's 100% human hair, uh, which is Indian, Brazilian, Peruvian, etc., which is quite expensive. And then there's the cheaper stuff, the synthetic fibers made by the Chinese and the Koreans. Now, I travel to all these countries several times. You know, Korea, uh, China, uh, India, Brazil. So when I was in India, that's when I discovered that if we are family and we lose a member of the family, all the ladies in the family go to the temple where they worship. And they have all their hair shaven off that hair is a sacrifice to their gods. What hit me personally was I saw those homeless, very poor people, their hair was being shaved off. I saw people I thought were sickly, maybe they had TB or something, their hair was being shaven off. Then, I don't know, some people maybe had sores on their, their scalp because as they were being shaven off, they were bleeding. So I, I said to myself, what is this? How did we, black people, end up in this space where we buy this, we actually pay US dollars for this? Now, to make it worse, <clears throat> when the hair is, is, is cut off, it, it falls on the floor. Mm. Then you get people, you know, putting little hips and so on. And then they were sorting it out. They were removing worms. They were removing lice. That day, I said to myself, no, there's something not right with us for this. Now I was flying back and, 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 and I was on Emirates and this, this thing was playing on my mind. I said, you know, when I grew up, when we grew up, there were no waves. So how did this start? Mm -hmm. Who started it? And who told the black lady that you're not beautiful? Mm -hmm. To be more beautiful, you must wear this thing. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if, you, if we go to a restaurant and, and, and you have uh, expensive food and we're eating the food, we find human hair in there. You know, we won't take it, it's contaminated. Mm -hmm. and, and if you and I go to, to Nyeri's mother and said, oh, Mama Zara, we're here, we'd like to shave each other's hair, can we do it in your kitchen? Mm -hmm. She would say, oh, no, 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 mm -hmm. because the hair once shaved off is dirt, mm -hmm. you throw it away. Mm -hmm. So gentlemen, do it outside and don't bring the hair into my house. But people would say, um, Sodom, that um, this hair gets washed 
Yeah. You know, there's a process, a manufacturing process that's done. It gets cleaned, pegged, pegged nicely and so forth. D does your point still stand? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to a, a trichologist, somebody specializing, he's got a doctor um, in, in, in hair and so on. Mm. Hair does not die. It's alive. Okay. So somebody commits a crime here and they leave a piece of hair. Even 25 years later, we can catch them because of DNA uh -huh. in the hair. And the trichologists tell us that if hair is in touch with another tissue, there is exchange of genetic material. People don't know this. Which means people who are gluing the hair or whatever, stitching, whatever, there is exchange of genetic material. They don't know what they're getting. It may not show in that individual, but in grandchildren, great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Trevor, there are three sources of this hair, live people, mm -hmm. dead people, mm -hmm. and of course these fibers. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a patient, um, uh, Mr. Makuni. Mak Mr. Makuni possesses a, a, a company called Steel Force in Waterfalls. He, he, we talk about this openly, and he doesn't mind me mentioning his name. Sure. So he was in Taiwan on business. So mm -hmm. he says, I get there, then I find that ladies who die in Taiwan, some of them anyway, just before burial, the hair is shaved off. Mm -hmm. Then they immediately get buried. Mm -hmm. So he says, um, they showed me a warehouse, huge warehouse, full of that hair, from here to over there. And he said to them, gentlemen, what are you doing with all this hair of people who've just been buried? Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, black people. Mm -hmm. Black people love this hair. This is big business, my friend. We are making tons of money billions of money in fact selling mostly to black people who are our biggest market. He says I just to them that wow. Now let's just think of, think of it for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, Trevor. <clears throat> a lady comes in here, she has this hair, because if you ask ladies with the expensive hair, the natural hair, if you say to them, is this hair from a dead person or a live person? They don't know. Mm -hmm. Now this hair, it will fall off in here, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, and so on. This dead people's hair, we don't know what those people died of. Mm. We don't know what disease was running in their family. We just buy. And remember, Trevor, it's not just about hair. It's about hair and skin. That's our issue. These are our issues. Now, the synthetic, but some say, oh, it's synthetic. To me, it's even worse, and I'll tell you why. What our people don't realize is this. Our skin and our hair, they need to breathe. Mm -hmm. Caucasians, white people have that kind of hair and that kind of skin because they come from a cold climate, minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius. There is snow. So that hair and that skin is an adaptation to their habitat, to their environment. So. That's why when white people come to this part of the world, because of the sun, mm. they get skin cancers mm. because they don't have pigment. This pigment is worth more than gold. And that, that is why albinos also get skin cancers because they have no pigment. That's why people who have applied ambi also get you know, damage, permanent damage to the skin. Mm. So we buy these so weaves or wigs, whatever, and put them on top of our own hair. Now, it means the scalp cannot breathe. Some people keep this for four weeks or even longer. What's happening? I said to the ladies, do you know, you get the hair on your scalp, your armpits, your private parts. Mm -hmm. Wherever there's hair, there's sweating. Mm. Could we go for three days or one week without washing your armpits and your private parts? No, you can't. Mm. When we keep sweat for just for two days, we start smelling. Mm. Now imagine the smell after two days. How does that sweat smell after four weeks? Mm. Well, what, what about the fact that the white people also wear wigs, don't they? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I've got some white people I work with and some of our enterprises, and they ask them. And normally when you see white people wearing wigs, they either they've got problems with their scalp, alopecia, or they're on chemotherapy, mm -hmm. or they're in a pantomime or some circus or something. Mm -hmm. Very few of them are actually wear to dress up, very few. I talk to them and they, and they don't do it. Mm. They don't do it. Our ladies actually wear these wigs to look beautiful. They think they look beautiful. Now, you know when they go for four weeks, this sweat, four week old sweat, mm. plus dandruff. And because of that, you get bacteria. Because the bacteria love this environment. It's hot, it's, 
it's, it's, it's, it's, it's wet. The bacteria get fed, feeding on the four-week-old sweat, four-week-old dandruff, and they multiply like crazy. I can tell you now, Trevor, all these ladies that we see, mm -hmm. they have millions, billions, trillions, zillions of bacteria on their scalp. And these bacteria then chew on the scalp and it's itchy, they go. Each time they're doing this, they're touching four-week-old sweat, dandruff and bacteria. And you know, they don't wash their hands. Mm. Maybe they're in a combi or in a bus, they just kill on, they're touching plates and all this and all that. I, I find it sad. You know, I want to make it very clear, because ladies think, wow, you can't tell us what to do. Please, I'm not telling anyone what to do. I don't have the power or the authority, even the interest or desire to tell people what to do. Do whatever you want. You, you, you want to wear the weave, wig, weave, whatever. You want to bleach your skin. Go ahead and do it. I'm just trying to share this information. And there's another point, Trevor, um, the effect on the black child. I was, um, I was invited as a guest speaker at um, NASH, National Association of Secondary School Headmasters in Trollbeck in 2015. And I said to the headmasters, you know, and headmistresses, you have an awesome responsibility to instill confidence in the black child. The black child must know there's nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with your hair. There is nothing wrong with your skin. God did not make a mistake on you. In fact, he gave you the best hair, the best skin. And it was embarrassing. I was at the podium, and all the hierarchy, the headmistresses, had weaves on, and the rest of them had weaves or wigs on. I said to myself, Solomon, what do you do? I said, well, I guess go ahead. And my point was, I said to them, we have headmistresses here who are teachers, who are mothers. Now, you are in education. You know more than I do. That every little child looks up to the mother, looks up to the teacher, looks up to the headmistress. The child has hair like mine, but mom has a weave, teacher has a weave, headmistress has a weave. The child in her own mind says, but how come my hair is not like my mom's hair, or my teacher's hair, or my headmistress's hair? It means there must be something wrong with me. So these people say this, we have to think about this, about the black child. Because by doing this, we may not be aware of it, but we're inflicting untold psychological damage on the black child. Because the child of the, the, the white child or the Japanese child grows up, they're confident. They don't worry about the hair, their skin. They think of development, innovation. I was just thinking, oh, the hair is not right. Oh, so the skin it goes is not back right. to the mindset yes. issue that you yes. spoke about. Exactly. Um, the, I've heard you say that. Um, What you are clear about is that the African woman is beautiful. Oh, yes. Doesn't need the, these other enhancement. No. And that we appreciate them with our natural hair. Yes. And we've seen a trend, the current Miss Universe from South Africa, I think. Yes. Um, Miss London. Miss London. Black Zimbabwe. So uh, there's a trend. Yes. Talk to me about that. Well, for the past five years, because now I give lectures at universities, churches, schools, or groups that invite me. And I always start by saying, the black woman is the most beautiful woman walking on planet Earth. She has the most beautiful natural hair, with, which has more options than any other race. The black woman has the most beautiful natural skin, smooth, radiant, wrinkle-free for many years. Our ladies will go to 50, 60, 70, 80. Skin is beautiful. Other races, early 40 is the wrinkle. Then they use anti wrinkling cream, anti aging cream, Botox, plastic surgery. The black woman doesn't need that. The black woman has the most beautiful natural lips, which are thick, fulsome, luscious, and very sexy. Mm -hmm. And the black woman is endowed with the most amazing erotic behinds. People are having surgery to enhance their behinds. Some are having buttock implants. The black woman has them already. The tragedy, Trevor is that um, the black woman is not aware of all this. And worse still, there are a lot of ignorant black men out there who are not aware of this. Now, we need to talk about hair, because once a year I go to Milan and Paris and so on. You know, these fashion shows in mm. Europe and, and, and in New York, you see these ladies from South Sudan, very dark, and they are bold, clean shaven, and they're on the catwalk. Any other race, if they did that, you would say, oh, maybe they're sick, maybe they have cancer, maybe they don't have chemotherapy. But black women can do black that. Black women is like, here I am. Mm -hmm. Take it or leave it, here I am. Very confident. Mm -hmm. 
a black is, woman's is, is it not that the men are want are asking the ladies to have the wigs and and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it not men who are doing that? They, they, they are because I've had um, uh, ladies have told me point blank. That's what my husband likes. And you know, and, and the young ladies tell me, oh, doctor, it's true, appreciating us the way we are. But most the guys that are chasing us want us to wear these wigs and waves. And Trevor, let me just explain this to sure. the ladies. So, clean shaven, the black woman looks like a goddess. And you've seen pictures of these girls from South Sudan and so on. Number two, check out any black lady with short hair. They look cute, they look clean, and they look younger. These weaves and wigs always give women years. Mm -hmm. They look more aged mm -hmm. than they are. Mm -hmm. Number three, check out a black lady with an afro, even a hair. They look like they have a crown on their head. They look majestic, like a queen. Only a black woman can wear an afro. And when I sponsored Maggie Samba's show, one lady in the audience said, we are the only ones whose hair is pointing upwards where to the heavens. Right. The rest of the people, their hair is pointing and, down. And they've got more options of course, to do with that, their hair. That's what I'm saying. But mm. people don't seem to realize that. Yeah. And when they you know, shampoo their hair with the reds from the rural areas, their hair can be straight too. They can do that with their own hair. And number five, when they plate their hair, our ladies can plate their hair a thousand different styles. Mm. And there's almost a mistake about it. Mm. And number six, when they have um, uh, uh, locks, they look very sexy. Only a black lady can do that. So I say to the ladies, look at the options that you have with your hair. Clean shave and you're beautiful. Short hair, afro, straight hair, plated hair, locks. You've got six options which no other race on earth possesses except you. Mm. You can look like the other races when your hair is straight, but the other races can never ever look like you. Why? Because you, the black lady, you are the original. You are the prototype. But because of the mindset, we abandon all these options, then we buy what the Indians would throw in the dustbin, the Brazilians would throw in the dustbin. Then the synthetics, these Chinese and Koreans, very crafty, they read our minds. Talk about the mindset, they read the mindset. Said, you see these people, they don't like, they've got beautiful hair, but they don't know it. They, they want, uh, to buy from the Indians and so on. So they pay lots of money, mm -hmm. you know, $50, or they're buying 100, 150, 200, 250. They're still buying 300. So, well, you see, those ones who can afford these figures are the few. The bulk of them in Africa, wherever the black people are, they can't afford, it's too expensive. Okay. It's not that black women want human hair. No, they want the look right. to look like a okay, just look a bit Asian. So let's make fibers, mm -hmm. which can just mimic. Mm -hmm. And, and, and are you winning this, this, this battle? It's slow, but yes. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I meet ladies everywhere. You know, okay, I've got lots of enemies maybe, but the other day I was... You've, you haven't been stoned yet. Well, I haven't, did I tell you why? In fact, I get a lot of uh, uh, accolades from some ladies. Was mm. When I meet a lady, say I meet Violet here for mm. the first time, I've never, we've never met. Mm. Maybe we're in the airport or in the shops or wherever. Uh, maybe here in Arari or whatever, whatever. I'll say to her, excuse me, lady, I have to tell you that you look so beautiful, so stunning with your natural hair. You see, I'm a naturalist. I absolutely adore. Mm. I respect. And I truly appreciate and love natural hair. When a lady has natural hair, it means she's got confidence within herself. It means she has inner beauty and outer beauty. You see, natural hair is elegant. Natural hair is classy. It's chic. It's a true sign of real sophistication. Because Trevor, there can be no so sophistication to buy what are the, the Indians throw in the dustbin. You pay for it and you put it on your head and you think you look beautiful. Mm -hmm. There can be no sophistication when you buy dead people's hair and you put it on your head and you think you look beautiful. There can be no sophistication, in my book at least, to buy fibers made to mimic like other races. They made those fibers so cheap so that even a maid can also wear the wave. Mm. They made it so cheap, even the young lady on the marketplace selling tomatoes and fruits now can wear this thing. My heart bleeds every time I go to the marketplace mm. and I see a lady, you know, slapping. What, what, what about a, a comeback that says, look, Solomon, you love bow ties. Yes. You love this stuff. Yes. This is all white men's stuff. It's nothing, it's nothing to do with white men or Asian mm. men or whatever, mm. no. Mm. I hear this argument. You see, the bow tie has no DNA. Okay. The bow tie does not harbor 
four-week-old sweat or four-week-old dandruff or bacteria. I have a lovely picture. That one time I had a visitor from um, um, San Francisco, an ice agent, mm. and another one had come from Holland, and there were three of us. Three of us had bow ties, and we had a picture taken. Lovely picture. Mm. This is universal. In my profession, it's very common to see ice agents wearing bow ties. Mm. So it's got nothing. To, I mean, it's not somebody's dirt. Mm. It's not a dead from a dead person. Yeah. Let's go to a very powerful point that you make about the connection between, for, for us in Zimbabwe, about that mindset and our local politics at the yes. moment. The disrepair out there, the infrastructure that's broken, our politics that's broken, our conversations that are non-existent, the insults and everything else. Is Explain that connection to me. Yes. <clears throat> I want to give you three examples. Uh, so three countries. First is Cuba, which are very different. Now, Cuba, one of the things I loved about the revolution, um, Fidel Castro and, and his government was you overthrow a system and then you bring literacy, almost 100% literacy. You give health to everybody. And Cuba, by the way, is more um, Olympic gold medals than any other country in South America. But it's a small country, mm. mostly like our population. And they've educated, they in, it developed the intellect of their people to the extent that they can export doctors, engineers, architects, and so on. And they have sanctions, by the way, mm. severe sanctions. Mm. Mm. Let's go to Finland. Finland, I had some Finnish people here, and they said, you have the best education system in the world, finest health service, and the in index of happiness is very high. How did you guys get to this place? And they said, well, you know, the economy, we had uh, forestry. That was a big thing. And you know, we have forests also in Eastern Highlands. And then, of course, pulp and paper industry. And then they went to um, uh, technology, Nokia. Mm. Today, their prime minister is a young lady, 34 years old. Yeah. The cabinet is 33, 32, 31. Okay? We go to Singapore. Small island, sand and stone, not a single mineral, no agriculture. 1965, at Independence, they were so poor, they lived in thatched houses. And they said the only natural resource we really have are brains. So they got the best brains, paid them the best to develop Singapore. And they ran like a company. So from third world to first world, 1965 to the mm. year 2000, mm. in 35 years, mm. they moved from third world to first world to be even better than European countries. Mm. Now, you ask about ourselves. Yeah. What do we have? We got diamonds, we got gold all over, we got platinum, we got chrome everywhere, we got lithium, we got 60 different minerals. Best soils, climate, we can grow anything. Name it, we can grow strawberries, you want mangoes, you want uh, sugar cane, you want everything we have. But we are poor. What I'm suggesting, Trevor, is the mindset. Whatever makes us not even ashamed to buy what other people throw in the dustbin is the same mindset that we have as a people. I'll tell you, there's a lovely article I read uh, in Terra Magazine in November. And the article said, um, it was an article on America on trial, um, the impeachment of Donald Trump. It was written by a chap called John Mitchum. And he said, politicians are far more a mirror of who we are rather than molders. We have to remember politicians don't come from another planet. No, they are part of us, our relatives, our uncles, and so on and so on. Who they are, they are reflecting who we are. Mindset. So our politicians right now, both in Zana PF and MDC, we really ought to be looking at ourselves and yes. say they, 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 they are a mirror of who we are. Of course, how do they get there? Yeah. We'll say, you know, chete chete or this or this, that, that. that's who we are. If we were switched on and, and a different mindset, we'd, we'd see through everything and say, what are we looking for? We're looking for visionaries. I remember reading an article on so Singapore. Before you go no. there, so how do we change that? So this is us, those politicians mirror who we are right now in Zimbabwe, in ZANU-PF and MDC. How do we change this? How do we get those visionaries that, that, that uh, are going to help change who we are? You know, we spoke about Finland. Mm -hmm. 
I personally have now only hope on youth. And I don't mean youth in just of age, mm. but youth in the sense of people with a vision. Because if you remember Castro and, and Esther Guevara were very young mm. when they got mm. they had this idealism of creating a society where even the poorest of the poor could get education and health. We have to look within ourselves and among ourselves, young people with this idealism, with this vision of changing other people's lives. Because where do you go into politics? We have to go into politics because we want to change people's lives for the better. Mm. If we cannot do that, we're not doing that, then we have no business being in politics. So That's what, my view. What message do you have for these young, those young people out there right now who are as messed up as you and I are, uh, and yet you say our hope lies in them? What message do you have for them? The future is theirs. This country belongs to them. I mean, people like you and I may be even too old for politics, you know, and you and I are maybe reasonably comfortable. We are on our way out. Um, they have to think very hard. They have to, again, as I say, go within themselves, look among themselves, and be serious about the vision for this country. And, and if this, the system was able to, to defeat the colonial system, it means everything can change. But it requires, like the, the liberation heroes, that resoluteness. People must be resolute and be determined to create a better society for all. But have a vision. Without a vision, we're not going anywhere. Vision, pragmatic. Singapore, they said, well, they had this MPH, meritocracy, yeah. pragmatism, and honesty, not corruption. You have to have somebody committed to that, mm -hmm. and, and, and young people really very clear mm -hmm. about, because we should be, if Singapore can be like what it is, with no minerals, nothing, nothing, mm -hmm. we should be better a thousand times better than Singapore with what we have. Solomon, um, you, you live a full life. You know, one other thing that I forgot to raise is you actually do horse riding dressage. I'm not going to ask you to talk about that right now. Right. But where do you get the time to do all this stuff? You know, uh, Trevor, I think if you really want to do something, mm -hmm. you create time for it. Interesting. You create time for it. Um, do, right. you, do you create time to read? Yes. What books have I'm, you read? I'm, I'm that, looking, uh, what books have you read which have uh, impacted you that you would recommend to our book-loving uh, viewers? Well, I like Lee Kuan Yew's um, uh, from Third World First World. Wow. I, I love that. And um, I've also read Sidangarembwa, Petina Gapa. Um, uh, right now, I'm very interested in investments. Oh, wow. Because I have this feeling that we are left out. We talk about real money. Is on the New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Australia. I remember Zimplus when it started. I attended one meeting, and I'm sorry I didn't follow it up, but people who were there, and unfortunately most of them were white people actually, the share price was 25 cents. So if you bought a million shares, you paid 250,000. This share was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Zimplus went up to $17 a share, which means somebody with a million shares from 250,000 mm. to 17 million. Now, that's real wealth. And people just invest, make this kind of money by just knowing how to invest. And I think very feeling that we black people don't really know how to invest. We need to find out more. So I read a lot about that. Mm. I know you are reading uh, investments into cryptocurrencies. Yes. Are you, are you making headway? <laughs> I'm reading a lot about it. You see, there are a lot of fake cryptocurrencies around, mm -hmm. and people can lose money. Mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin is the one, of course, which is, um, you know, you, you can see it on CNBC mm -hmm. or Bluebeck. Uh, people who started off earlier mm -hmm. did make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Now I'm watching the trend and reading a lot about it before mm -hmm. I actually get involved. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I also read a lot about gold and about other things as well. But I just think youngsters must have financial literacy even people who are professionals, they must learn how to invest. Because you, sometimes you see professionals getting old and, 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 and they're desperate, you know, they, they don't have anything. And, and so on. But it's a question of that financial literacy as well, which is important. Wow, Solomon, what an amazing conversation. First of all, 
thank you so much for inviting us to your beautiful home. Um, um, a, um, an amazing life. I, I know I use this word quite a lot because I am running off out, of, out of words to describe you. You are, you are a dancer, you are a medical doctor, you uh, love horse riding, you collect art, uh, sculptor, you're passionate about how our women look. But more than that, you've got a big heart. Um, so thank you so much for having us in your home and thank you for this conversation. Allow me to turn to our audience at home to thank you for watching us uh, in the diaspora all across the continent. Thank you for tuning in to watch these uh, quality conversations to make sure that you don't miss out on In Conversation with Trevor, which is a weekly show. Please press this little button here and subscribe and you get a notification every time we have a new program. We are a weekly show. Do not miss time, miss out. Until next time. Cheers. Okay.